Today's scripture comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 23 to 28, and chapter 8, verses 23 to 25. Thus he said, the four beasts will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever." Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself." In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people, and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. This is the word of God. Uh, today, uh, we are, uh, I believe it's the seventh uh, sermon in, uh, in Daniel, book of Daniels. Uh, I'm going to cover two chapters today, seven and eight. Um, it is very dense. It has a lot of information, and uh, actually, if you don't have some background uh, information and knowledge about this. This is a really confusing uh, part of the Bible. Uh, this is called, uh, so uh, first six chapters of Daniel is talking about Daniel's life experience, his, uh, you know, his friends uh, in this foreign country. Uh, and then um, a seven, it shifts entirely and it going to prophetic works. It's called apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is very distinctive genre, and, and in it, it has a different um, um, way of understanding, interpret, interpreting this, this part of the Bible. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak about this, and then chapter 9 uh, uh, next week, and uh, it kind of runs together, so I'm going to just do some groundwork uh, today. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, all the details and all that kind of things. And, uh, but kind of be, give you a big picture. Uh, unlike any other holy scripture of other religions, uh, including Quran and, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist uh, and all that, uh, Bible is only unique holy scripture that quarter, 25% by volume, is a prophetic material. And prophetic material, uh, out of that, there are a considerable amount of this apocalyptic literature. Uh, it, it requires a different science of interpretation, is what we call hermeneutics, and through it we understand. Uh, but these are very complicated. There are many, many uh, different opinions about this. So I'm going to just lay it out to you and um, um, you know, just give you a, a skeleton uh, understanding of what this is about. This chapter, uh, especially seven, introduces three actors of this divine uh, com comedy or drama, you want to call that, from creation to the end of the world. And, and in it, uh, it, it, has, it talks about um, what we, what we uh, know as antichrist figure. Uh, it has many different names and all that, but it introduces son of man, Jesus Christ in Old Testament setting, and this is the beginning of his title, uh, Jesus' title as Son of Man. And, and it has many, many meanings to it, and it actually defines uh, who he is. And you'll be surprised how accurately defines Jesus Christ. 
And uh, it, it also uh, introduces God with a different name. It's called Ancient of the Days. Uh, and um, is, is, a, is a advanced one or Ancient of Days or whatever uh, translation we want to use. The three actors here and um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, the Antichrist figure rises from different uh, situations and different kingdoms culminating into one uh, one person who is so empowered by Satan himself as if Satan has incarnated, just like Jesus was, uh, uh, God incarnated. And, and this one will bring such a havoc at the end of the ages. And, and, and then, uh, then God has to intervene, uh, otherwise... Um, it could destroy the whole humankind, and God intervenes. And that's the end of the book. Uh, people often ask me, what kind of uh, eschatology do you have? Meaning, how do you understand the uh, end time? Uh, is it premillennial? If you don't know, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll talk about it next week a little bit. Premillennialism or postmillennialism or amillennialism and all that kind of things. I usually say I'm panmillennialist. Everything is going to pan out. Don't worry about it. Uh, because uh, is this, this um, I'm saying this not because it's not important. It's very important. At the same time, about this, you and I can do nothing about. Right? This is whether you believe or not, it's going to come. Whether you do this or that, it's going to come. All right? This is something that God has decreed. And it's not going to change. Now, we don't know that timing. That's where everything gets hairy. But especially last few years, if you, you know, if you are like thinking person as a believer with some kind of biblical background, kind of looking back, you can extrapolate going forward. Oh my gosh, this is possible. And that's why I want to kind of talk about this because this kind of gives you a framework of your faith. You know, a lot of people these days, young people, young pastors are saying, gospel center, you got you to, gotta, everything is here. You know, I understand that because that's the most important thing happened. But if you take out the creation account, where, how, where we come from, to whom we belong, and then how it's going to end, what kind of judgment is going to come, if you take this out, this cannot stand by itself. And it's so important to have this, this background noise, if you want to call that, right? So, let me start with you here. Okay? Um, it, sorry. Um, all right. Eschatology, that means a study of end times, is an important part of our faith serving as bookends along with the Genesis by which our forefathers of our faith have endured persecution and even gave up their lives for eternal kingdom of God. When we lack this part of faith, we then become short-sighted, having no real hope or purpose. This is a problem that modern-day Christians have so many addictions, sin in their life, and they, uh, they don't know why they exist, uh, and, and they're just wasting their time and resources. Uh, and we are running around the circle. And there's nothing that is something to die for, something to live for in our faith anymore because we lack this part of um, faith. So that's why I'm talking about it today. Now, eschatology, there are many people talk about it. John, Apostle John has a revelation. Paul talks about it in, 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 in um, uh, Thessalonians, especially in other parts as well. Uh, and the gospel account, God, like Matthew 24 or Luke 21, even those have Jesus speaking about last days. So it is all over the Bible. Uh, and the bits and pieces in Ezekiel and, and uh, you know, Zechariah and all other parts of the uh, Bible. But nothing like Daniel putting all together or revelation and talks about it. Daniel approaches this end time as a government official. So he's looking at kingdoms and government and the structure, how it's going to come. And John 
is most comprehensive one. He's, he talks about not only government and angle, but also environmental and also finance and, and um, people, you know, church, you know, change. Paul talks about it as an apostle, as a pastor, and this is how people are going to change. You know, and theologically, this is what gonna, what's going to happen afterwards. So there are many different angles about this. Therefore, this eschatology is not a minor part of our faith. It cannot be neglected. In fact, as I said, because we've been neglecting this so long, and that's why our faith has become so unhealthy in many ways. So we sweat the little things. And we forget about the big picture. So today, we're going to zoom out and see the big picture of it. And many of you will be helplessly lost in this sermon, and which is okay. All right? As I said, whether you know it or not, it's going to happen. All right? So, but I'm going to explain to you why these things will matter and, and how we conduct ourselves uh, in in align to this truth, and, and that's what I'm going to talk And I'm going to introduce something else. This is like Daniel encounters angel for revelation. I'm just slipping this in because a lot of people have this like a mushy idea about supernatural and, and all that kind of things, and, and they think it's like a mythical or, or, or uh, you know, fairy tale uh, kind of thing. And that's why their expectation and imagination of this, this uh, their faith is so, you know, kind of dislocated, that's why they don't really experience or expect uh, a God seriously in their lives. Uh, and that's why their faith is not growing. I want to kind of give you this portion of it. So he came near, this Gabriel, the angel, uh, to where I was standing. When he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, a son of man, understand uh, that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up upright, stand upright. He said, behold, I'm going to let you know uh, what will occur uh, at the final period of the indignation. And it it pertains uh, to the appointed time of the end. And if you read the end of chapter 8, he became so sick for several days because of this encounter. What, 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 what I'm trying to say. A lot of people think, you know, like supernatural God coming and then all that kind of stuff will be just peaceful and nice. That's not usually the case. It's awesome God. And our sinfulness will make us shudder and full with the fear and faint. Uh, and and that's, that's the thing that we see in, in Daniel and we see in Ezekiel and, and, and John as well. Uh, and so... This kind of a, a lot of just fuzzy ideas that we have that has nothing to do with the scripture. Um, and we just want to kind of correct that today. Uh, symbolic language. This portion of the Bible, apocalyptic writing, is filled with symbols and, uh, and numbers. Uh, and this, this type of prophecies are very difficult to understand. And that's why you need to have a lot of background in these symbolic languages and the history and, and, and how it's used to understand what it means. Um, obviously, we cannot get to all that. And there, there are churches who spend months, years in, this, in these things and to go through that. And I don't think uh, we need to do that. So I'm going to just do a just basic understanding uh, so that we don't get lost in here. Now, first of all... Um, The Daniels, so please go home and read at least uh, Daniel 7, 8, and 9 uh, together. So next week we're going to talk about 9. And I'm going to just skip out a lot of details um, and all that. But this is a gist of vision that Daniel saw. Daniel saw the vision in the out of the sea. There are four beasts come out of it. And and, uh, each beast stands for empires, dynasties. And then um, the, 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 some animals have like horns, and horns usually stand for authority and power, many times kings uh, and all that. And, and, uh, and these will interact with one another, and so kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, uh, and all that will happen. 
but out of the sea it happens. So you got to understand this context here. Uh, scripture, especially apocalyptic writing, uh, they use a symbol of sea, ocean, for chaos, sometimes fallen world, as if the waves up and down and the tosses about and storms come and all that, and the world of chaos and the worsening situations. So, um, so here, the kingdoms rise and fall in, fall, in, the, in this for, fallen world, which is typically in some kind of turmoil in the worsening chaos. Therefore, the sea in prophecy is usually a symbol for chaos and sometimes fall, fallen world as opposed to the chosen people of God. So these this nations and powers rise uh, 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 as a result of some kind of chaos and respond to uh, uh, you know, uh, catastrophes and things like that. So first of all, uh, Daniel sees this uh, <coughs> lion uh, with, with wings. And let, let, I found this uh, in the internet. I was busy looking for these things in the internet. Um, and this is actually Louvre. Uh, you go to Paris and Louvre, you can see this. And they took it from Iraq. Uh, and uh, uh, that as the first animal that, you know, uh, the, anim, uh, the Daniel saw was a lion with, with the wings of eagle. And that stands for Iraq, uh, uh, Babylon, that is. And this is not something that Daniel made up. This, this country was known for this emblem. All right? Everybody knows they're talking about Babylon uh, when, when he sees this. Uh, and then second animal came as a bear. Uh, that bear stood for, in that uh, trans, uh, interpretation by the angel, uh, it was a Mede-Persian empire, modern-day Iran and, and uh, Kurdistan and Iran. Um, that area, that power, uh, and then the, that power was uh, pushed away by another um, leopard with the four heads and the four wings. And leopards stand for a, a Greek empire, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, and when he died, and then four generals, that's why four head. And after that follows a hideous animal that, that, uh, that Daniel didn't know how to name. Uh, and there's a fourth empire. And this fourth empire stands for Roman Empire, but this Roman Empire never ceases. In other words, the Roman Empire extends into the final time, Okay. Now, so that's, that's what it is. This is identical to the vision, uh, the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2. We talked about he saw a statue uh, where the head was gold, the chest was silver, belly was bronze, and the leg, thigh and the leg, and the toe, the thigh and the leg is iron, and the, when it goes to the toe, it's mixed with clay. Uh, and uh, the first is Babylon, the gold, and the, the Mede, uh, Persian, and Mede Empire and Persian Empire are usually together because it lasted only a couple of years, and it was as a, a vassal nation. So they're all, it's pretty much Persian Empire. And then after that, the Persian Empire was, was uh, destroyed by Alexander the Great, uh, Greek Empire, which had a cultural influence in all of Mid Middle Eastern and the European uh, area. And then after comes Roman Empire, a military might uh, powerhouse. And, uh, but they kept the Greek culture. That's why we call it Greco-Roman Empire uh, and, and the you know, language as well. So that's, that's what it is. But if you remember that statue uh, vision, the dream, that when it stands, and the, there's a rock that was not cut with a human hand, natural rock, that comes and destroys this statue. It scatters apart. That rock is a rock of Jesus. Uh, and, and that same thing repeats here uh, in, this, in this vision as well. Uh, and... and so this, uh, I'm just telling you the symbols and all that kind of stuff. Now, we're going to focus a little bit on the second beast and actually third beast uh, who's going to uh, do the work 
today. And fourth beast, uh, we're going to talk more, uh, more about it uh, next week. And, and so, but in this chapter, um, as I mentioned, there are three actors. Uh, number one is this Antichrist figure. But then number two, the Ancient of Days, the God, the Father is introduced in the background. And uh, how he's in sovereign, sovereign God with all over. And then the Son of Man, Jesus, is called Son of Man. And how accurately and so to detail it describes hundreds of years before Jesus was born and, and uh, he did a, a ministry in that way. In fact, next week you'll be talking about how accurately this is all uh, lined up for his cross, his actually entry in uh, Palm Sunday, his entry in, into the, uh, uh, Jerusalem. And it's all by days, it's numbered by days, and it will be uh, um, in that way. And so um, now we want to talk about uh, this repetition of, of the history. That is this. When God does something, he prophesies it. And then there is a historical fact that aligns with that comes. But that's not the fulfillment of prophecy. That's only a foreshadow of things to come. And after that, another thing comes, and it kind of becomes normalized. And then finally, that same uh, prophecy becomes really wicked at the last turn, and it just destroy the whole thing. And that happens. So today I'm going to kind of give you uh, an example of that. And um, so uh, I'm going to focus on the third animal uh, that is a, a leopard. Uh, and um, this leopard is a Greek empire. Uh, and from Daniel's point, this is to come, right? So Daniel uh, served as a counselor to the king under Nebuchadnezzar. And then the following kings until Belshazzar. Uh, and, then, and then Darius, the Mede uh, uh, Empire. After that, Cyrus, the Persian Empire. So he survived uh, and three empires uh, in that brief time of his life. Uh, and uh, so Greek hasn't come yet. And so that to him, that's future to come. And Roman Empire is future to come. So that's the situation here. So we want to talk about... This is second animal, which is a, a mid-Persian empire, and, and uh, uh, the Greek empire uh, defeats that. Uh, and the Greek empire, uh, Alexander the Great, if you know the history, he became the general, uh, as, a, as a Macedonian uh, prince, he became a general in his age 13. Can you believe that? Their parents? You're a 13-year-old leading an army, go to our, <laughs> the war. And, and uh, he died in age 33 in Babylon. Uh, in, in that time, he conquered, quote-unquote, known world in that area, including parts of India. And uh, when he died, in the, at the height of his, his uh, career, so to speak, Four generals under him splits the empire, including Egypt and uh, you know in other parts, and they all become the emperors of, the, of those empires. That's why the four horns uh, it becomes that, and and out of that one empire, Seleucid Empire. Um, ruled over Palestine. And, um, you know, there's Apocrypha. There's uh, the books. Uh, that's not part of our Bible, but Catholics uh, include that as, um, what is it, the um, uh, helpful books, not as a scripture, but help, helpful books for our faith. Apocrypha has a, a Maccabees, and Maccabees is the is a, the Jewish heroes, and the, those mention about this horn. This uh, out of four, one becomes uh, really prom prominent, and and this is the one. Um, and his name is Antichrist, Antichrist the four, um, and um, 
He is the type of or template of demonized leader that is actually going to come what we call Antichrist at the end of the time. But this guy is, did something very particular. Um, and um, he, um, he came to Jerusalem temple and uh, he destroyed it, uh, destroyed Jerusalem and, and Jerusalem temple, and he sacrificed a pig in the altar, therefore defiling uh, a Jewish temple. And uh, you know, in Jewish uh, Judaism, a uh, pig is an unclean animal, and he he um, you know spread his blood all over. And so, uh, December sixth, um, one sixty seven B.C., he does this, and. The, the sacrifice and worship ended for three years until the Jews come together and, and uh, cleanse the temple and rededicated the temple on the December 14th, 164 B.C. So this is kind of foretaste of what's to come, right? And um, so if I can show you the picture, I was busy looking for all these images uh, and I wasted my, all my time, uh, you know. Uh, but anyway, to serve you, uh, for those people, you know, this is a forehead, a leopard, and, you know, these are the generals of, of Alexander, which in chapter 8 is depicted as a goat. Uh, there's a, a ram and a goat, a budding head, and the ram is a, a mid-Persian empire, uh, and he got as the loss, this Artaxerxes and this uh, Persian kings, uh, and they lost, and the Greek uh, power. And this is Greek power after uh, Alexander the Great and splits into four. And this is a temp uh, one of the horn that comes to Jerusalem and destroys it. And this is the coin that celebrates um, Antiochus IV, who have defiled the temple uh, of uh, of Jewish uh, temple so uh, in Jerusalem. So this shuts down Jewish worship uh, for um, three, uh, three years. Now, remember this? Nebuchadnezzar the king came and destroyed Jerusalem and shuts down a temple, all right? And after that, but he was not demonically empowered person. He was just you know, in fact, he's called the servant of God because Judah was so bad sinning against God. He came as an instrument of God's judgment, and he destroyed it. He went, and then after that, uh, you know, Cyrus, uh, the Persian king, said, okay, you guys can go back. According to Jeremiah's a prophecy of 70 years, they came back, rebuilt the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah, and when they rededicated that temple, it was so sad. It's not like Solomon's temple. So people who saw Solomon's temple, when they saw the second temple, they wept and cried because it was not to be compared and all that. And that temple, Antiochus uh, the fourth came and destroyed it and defiled it and so that they could not worship there anymore. So now, that temple is the second temple, but then... Jewish people um, call, you know, Herod the Great, the hero the who wanted to kill Jesus, baby Jesus. The hero, in order to uh, buy the uh, loyalty from the Jewish folks, because he was half Jew, He's a, he was an Edomite. Uh, and, and in order to do that, he built the temple in the most beautiful Romanesque uh, uh, architecture. And he was into this Roman architecture. So he built Caesarea by the sea and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, so he builds this church. Uh, technically, it's the third temple, but they call it still second temple. Uh, and this temple was destroyed by Roman force AD 70. 30 some years after Jesus was crucified, that temple was destroyed. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, uh, what I'm saying is this, there, the prophecies, some people think it's only one time. It's not. It, it repeats itself. And to the last and ultimate uh, cycle, that's when demonically empowered things happen and then that um, you know, end comes. And that's what it is. So this one, uh, I look 
first. So don't, never mind everything here, all right? Uh, yeah. Number one is on your left side, Antiochus IV uh, shuts down the temple by defiling it um, between, um, uh, you know, uh, 167 to 164 B.C., and after that, Jesus talks about it on, on, on the top, right hand top. Jesus prophesies about this will be shut down. Uh, and after about 30 some years after the cross, the Titus, the Roman general, comes in AD 70 and, and uh, he defies the temple again. And uh, not one stone upon another stone is left. Because by that time, when Herod built that Romanesque temple, they put gold between the stones. And so they knew about that. So knock out every stone. This is why Jesus said, not one stone will be set on another stone. And they knock out all the stones and got all the gold and uh, everything else is destroyed. Now, this is not what the prophecy is talking about. It's yet to come. That is a final version of this. There is going to be Antichrist figure who's going to destroy the temple again. But you know, there's no temple here. You know? That's why in Israel there's a third temple project is going on. And uh, that, you know, they'll prepare everything else. And that's another story as well. Here. So um, when, when these things happen, the early churches are so confused. It is a Lord coming back right now, you know? So uh, for those of you who are very new in our faith, um, Jesus came to provide as a sacrifice for our sin. He died on the cross. But that's, and, and then he ascended. He went to heaven with the Lord, uh, the Father. He's interceding for us. But there come a time, this, is, this prophecy is talking about, there come a time, the second coming of Jesus, the returning of Jesus, this is called in, in Greek, parousia. Parousia is returning of Jesus. And that's where the end of history, human history will happen. All these things, the drama of, of good and evil, uh, and all that will end permanently. And then the kingdom of God eternally will happen. And that's, that's the prophecy, this prophecy is all, all about. It's giving a skeleton view. I, I, I'm giving a skeleton view because it, it gives a lot of details in between. But uh, I'm just giving a skeleton view so that you don't get lost. And next week when we talk about 70 weeks of Daniel, and you'll become very clear that, that you know, the building of the temple and the cross, Jesus' cross is numbered by day. And you'll be just blown away how accurately it's numbered uh, and, and all that kind of things. Anyways, so here uh, Paul talks to the Thessalonians about this. And Thessalonians were really confused. Now, what's going to happen, you know, uh, the end, end of the day? And so he said, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Two things must happen first, right? And, and, and the son of uh, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the same name for Antichrist figure, and who opposes and exalts himself above every so called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. This is an abomination of desolation, and we're going to talk about that later on. So there are a lot of terminologies and a lot of uh, 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 schedule, time, and all that kind of things. You don't have to get lost. But there are two things here I want you to pay attention. Apostasy means falling away in Greek. Unless you're with somebody, falling away would not happen. And this is falling away of a church is talking about. All right? And as we approach those days, the church and denominations will fall away from the truth. And they're compromised and they become more like the world. And they be, actually become part of persecuting the real believers. So only the remnant will be saved. And that's the overarching scheme of, of the um, uh, this message. Now, so here, then the lawless one, the lawless one, as I say, Antichrist figure, the son of destruction, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end 
by appearing of his coming. So second coming, or the parousia, uh, is where everything is closed, uh, you know, will be done permanently, right? And this son of destruction, the lawless man, cannot be destroyed by any human being. It's so powerful, has so much influence, and is a, a demonically empowered person uh, in, in the history. So uh, that, you know, that is what it's talking about in chapter 8 in particular. Um, so I, I'm just throwing out to you all kinds of elements to it so that when uh, next week when we put together that you have some kind of reference point and all that. So here, this is a fourth beast. This is a Roman Empire, and there's a hideous beast that, that Daniel didn't know how to name this. Uh, and, um, and, and this beast is empire that has ten horns, meaning ten uh, the kings or, or um, Sometimes it actually stands for a group of people as well. Uh, and out of ten, uh, the three will be knocked out by one little horn. And this one little horn has a blasphemous mouth. And it starts speaking loud things against God. And then it takes over. This is an anti antichrist figure uh, that uh, actually takes over uh, and uh, wage war. Now, I want you to kind of... Um, um, understand it's a ki kingdom's rise and fall through the calamities and, and chaos. And, um, you know, out of human wisdom, we pick the leaders and follow and all that, and it's going to progressively get worse. That's what it means, right? In the scripture, it talks about the good will become better and bad will become worse. There's a polemic divide will happen. That is within the church to begin with. Not, not to mention the world, but within the church. And that, that uh, those in the church that have fallen away apostasy will be part of the persecution uh, against uh, uh, the true believers. That's, that's what, what it's saying. So, um, so uh, in Daniel chapter 8, 9 through 11, and we were talking about the horns, uh, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south and toward east. Now, what is this? Uh, the hideous beast is a Roman empire, and, and from Rome goes to southeast. What is that? Israel, right? And this is a, a beautiful land called Holy Land. Holy Land, he's just calling a beautiful land. Uh, it grew up uh, to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth. This is, um, this is where the spiritual beings, like an uh, angelic uh, power, are actually influenced by it, and it follows its power. It, it's, it's the talk about Satan getting one-third of the stars uh, and uh, the, the demonic angels have fallen uh, and things like that. And it tramples them down and even magnifies itself to be equal with the commander of the host. This is what? Captain of the host. Who's that? It's Jesus Christ. He's talking about in the Old Testament. Uh, and, um, and it removes the regular sacrifice from him and the uh, place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Okay, so this is... Their history is like Antichos and Titus, the general, Roman general. But there come a time, and this guy, the man of lawlessness or son of dis, uh, desolation, this guy will be empowered by Satan himself. And he will have an incredible influence and power, and he will, he will run amok uh, uh, of the whole world. Uh, and and uh, that, that person will overcome believers. There are going to be tough time for believers. That's the thing. And this guy, how does he get the power? He gets power with intrigue and deception. And uh, so here, uh, uh, Daniel chapter 8. Please go home and read ch chapter 7 and 8 and 9. Uh, so, and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed uh, by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while uh, they are at ease. 
Okay, it always happens at ease. And chaos, we are, we, are, we are contracted at ease. You know, we just cast off restraint. And at ease, he will deceive and got that. And, and even oppose the prince of peace, prince of princes. Who's that? Jesus Christ once again. And he will be broken without human agency. In other words, he will oppose uh, Christ, but he will be destroyed not by any human being because no one can, but God himself will intervene. So uh, there, there, are, there are, you know, times that, as I said this before, this divine drama, um, you know, one of the reasons that I'm not really focusing regularly on this topic is that there's nothing we can do about this. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, so... Uh, recognize that, and there's a reference point in our faith. Now, uh, know, um, know that we have different destiny from the rest of the world. Therefore, keep your faith in most holy manner, uh, not to be swept away with the fancies of this passing world, knowing that the difficult time must come first uh, before the deliverance at the last days. Right? So, let me say this again. Um, you know, so if you go to Revelation uh, and talks about it, it talks about seven different kingdoms because it, it adds uh, Egypt and Assyria, then Babylon uh, and Persia and uh, Greece and uh, Rome. Uh, but from Daniel's point, in the past, he doesn't care. And he just have these four uh, uh, kingdoms. But the last one I'll be talking about next week is it didn't finish with the Roman Empire. It continues on. And, and this will come to full power at the end of it. And this will produce what you call uh, Antichrist uh, and all that, right? So, um, so what, do we, uh, what do we get out of this? Then, and, and, and who are living this time and uh, um, place? Number one, the one caveat of the whole thing is we don't know when end is going to start, okay? We know Bible says very clearly when Jesus will enter into Jerusalem as a king or prince from the time of the declaration to go and rebuild a temple uh, from uh, Cyrus' command. Exact days are numbered and it fits right in. But the, when, the, when, when this, this a seventh, I mean the 70th week, a 70th seven will start, nobody knows, right? And that's why, um, you know, there, any, any generation can be terminal generation. We used to say in 1980s and 90s, it could be a terminal generation, it could be. But until now, we didn't have the technology or necessary things that, that can actually push us over that. But now, we are actually entering into that period. That's the scary thing. So you cannot insist it's going to happen next year or, or, or seven years down the road. You cannot say that. At the same time, we are prepping up uh, for that because people are changing. Our values are changing. And that's why. So, how do, we, how do we live as believers? Once again, this is a big picture. This is what I'm talking about. I know some of you have a, 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 a very hurtful marriage relationship. Uh, some of you have children that, that are just, just destroying your life right now. Uh, and, and some of you have health issues. Some of you have financial or, or, or career issues. Goal or, or whatever else. Some of you are answering whether, uh, asking whether God has called you into full time ministry or not, and all these different things. Let me tell you this those are minor details when you look at this. And this is what, what we call dispensation of God. This is economy of God. This is timeline of God. And no matter what we do, nothing is going to change this outcome. That's the thing. So what do we do then? We have to fit into that schedule, right? We have to know where we stand and how things are going. And so that you will teach your children. 
that they may keep the most holy faith in these changing times. Maybe, you know, I told you about this um, many years ago when ISIS were killing people uh, in northern Iraq, Mosul area and all that. And the one, um, one Christian that escaped that, is a, he was a principal of a high school or some kind of school uh, and all that. And um, he said overnight his bank account, you know, he was saying, I was just like you. I was a middle class, uh, you know, uh, citizen. I had a house, I had a bank account, I had a car, I had my kids had a future. One day, it's all gone. My, my bank account, my house, my, my you know, future, my children's future. And I was so worried about my children going to right college. All of a sudden, that wasn't the question. My child died because he didn't spit on, on, on the name of Jesus. And, and all of a sudden... What he was saying is this, my life was not that much different than yours. And all, overnight, everything changed. That confession that Jesus is Lord made or broke my life. And that's what he was sharing. And, and I'm saying to you, this is not, you know, we don't have that dramatic experience here. But this is what, what the reality of spiritual realm and this is what we need to expect as we go cross uh, into that. Our values must be, and our conduct and the uh, life must align to this. Um, so then let me introduce a second uh, actor here um, that, uh, you know, um, the chapter 7 talks about is the Son of Man. And I'm going to talk more about this. This is the first introduction in such a clear, clear concept and a messianic prophecy that talks about who Jesus is. And uh, Daniel used Son of Man as, as a, a humanity many times, but here it defines Son of Man. So Jesus, in his ministry, he calls himself Son of Man. This is a title that he loved to use, uh, referring to himself. And so Son of Man, what is a Son of Man? Here, uh, chapter 7, uh, 13 through uh, 14, it talks about this, right? I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with a cloud of heavens, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days is another title for God the Father. And, and uh, one who's advanced in days or Ancient of Days. That's his title. Uh, God is also called Ancient of Days. So Son of Man, Jesus Christ, comes to the Father, and that's what he's seeing here, uh, and was presented before him. The fa God the Father is presenting to Son of Man, uh, the, the, his son Jesus Christ, um, presented him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. This is a very clear picture of Jesus uh, uh, giving his life on the cross, resurrected and, and ascended, and, and this, is, this is what it's describing here. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, the everlasting kingdom. And the word here, the serve, is a palau, and palau in Hebrew is to serve. But remember this, I told you this many times, the, um, the, um, the Daniel is written in two language, languages. Chapter one is in Hebrew, and two to seven is written in Aramaic. This is a, a Syrian language, uh, Aramaic. In Aramaic, palau is not serve, it's worship, it's a prostration. Worship God. So this, the, the one I uh, underlined there, and uh, the people of every language, every people and all that will come and worship him and his dominion, everlasting dominion. And where do you see the, the mirroring of this? Uh, is in Philippians chapter 2 when Paul is writing to Philippian church, and this is not Paul's writing. Paul is only quoting 
the ancient hymn that was already sung in the Christian communities. How do we know that? It's written in stanzas and verses. And he says this in, in Philippians chapter 2, 9 and 11. He says, For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is of every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and uh, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. This is, you know, you know, you know this song because he exists as, as God, but he didn't consider uh, something to be grasped. He became, emptied himself, become a man, and, and found in the form of a servant. He is crucified and all that. And after that, God the Father lifted him up, and that's the picture here. And this one mirrors exactly uh, the prophecy of, of uh, the vision of Daniel. And this Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is an answer for the hard times uh, that is to come. Now, so the hard times that people were experiencing at the time were terrible persecutions. And all that. I don't have time to go through all that. But at the same time, and, and the scripture is talking about, but the time will come that Jesus will take away every tear from the believers. Now here, the big picture is this. The lesson today is this. This too shall pass. All right? And th- those of you who are, who are suffering from many things, as I mentioned, different things. Remember, that's not the end of the game for you. That too will pass. In fact, if we are actually entering into the last days, hard time will come just to keep your faith. You have to sacrifice yourself. You have to endure hardship just to keep your faith. Suffer tremendously even that time know that this too shall pass. So this is what Paul says. After all that, and he says, Second Timothy and all that, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself, if somebody looks at your life, and say, that person really lives loving the return of Jesus, loving his appearance. Is it? Or they're going to say, that guy, you know, is doing the same thing again. There's some people in our church who's been here about 20 years, you know, Never got serious in their faith. Well, you know, I got to get the business going. Well, I got kids now. I kids, I have to take them. And I have to, now I have to travel around to find the kids in the right college. Always there's something. You know, when you look at the bigger picture of all this, those things are minor details in life. I'm not saying they are not important. But that's not the fullness of your faith. The faith is this big picture. And therefore, we should live accordingly because these two shall pass. You know, there are times easy to get around like hundreds of people like this. There are times we cannot even get around five people together. Right? One of the reasons we, we, we got out of um, Urumqi, China, Xinjiang province, where they're, they're persecuting the Uyghur people. Um, we had to pull out because, you know, uh, what was it, Chris was there, over there? Um, the, the three, four people can't even get together. And especially you mix with, uh, you know, uh, the Uyghur people, they'll just take you out. We couldn't do anything, so we had to pull out of that place. Sometimes it's like that. You know, China was easy to get together before. Russia was easy to get together. That window of opportunity, this is why we do missions. Window of opportunity is not that wide, we notice. It changes. 
And we should live according to God's dispensation and time. Because difficult time will come first. It's not going to just get better and better and better. No, difficult time will uh, come. And uh, I kept looking, and the horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. I want you to know, this is as we go into uh, end time and all that, and the Christians will be killed, just like early Christians. They have to give up their lives. And uh, when they say persecution, you know, the people have no idea. When, when the Roman government comes and um, put that tag on your house, means you are exempt from police protection. In other words, anybody can come in your house, get your stuff, and walk out there without any consequences. They can, they can abuse your children right in front of your eyes, and, and they have no consequences because you get, you get no police protection. That's a persecution. We think it's just like, well, you know, this and that. No. Difficult time will come. The evil will do is, is worst. So, why am I worried about this? Well, if you're not coming to last days, I mean, why are we talking about this? I'm worried about this. Because, do you know, in 21st century, 21st century, last 20 years or so, we have more martyrs for Christian faith than 2,000 years put together. Did you know that? In uh, Iraq, uh, and especially Iraq and uh, Syria, northern part of it, Kurdistan, we call it, Eastern Christians. Used to be there were 1.2 million believers. It cannot be really exact, but around 1.2 million believers in northern Syria. And there are about 1 million believers, Eastern believers, um, in, in northern uh, Iraq, Mosul, Erbil, that, what we call Kurdistan, and southern part of Turkey. Because of this war and ISIS, uh, as they went around and killing people, beheading them and all that kind of stuff, this is all scattered. Many died and uh, scattered. Now we have less than quarter million believers in those regions. Think about that. This has never happened before uh, in, in our history, and yet churches don't really care. It's not that important. More than that, more than that is this. People are changing. You know, like, uh, um, you know, this uh, pandemic and all that, and, uh, you, know, the, you know, worshiping through Zoom and all that. Um, how many of you know somebody you know in your life, after pandemic, they never actually um, came back to faith? A lot of them lost it altogether. It was a good excuse and he was out. They have never took it seriously. And now it's materialized. It was given a permission. Do you, what, how do you think the, the leader who's going to influence the whole world is going to intrigue and deceive people? They think they're going to come. We're going to be doing something against church. No, they're not going to do that. It's for your safety, your health, and it's being equal to everybody, being fair. That's why you got to do this, and you got to do that. And that's the way... It's going to be introduced, and the churches who do not follow that will be identified as a troublemakers. And that's how things work. And so the difficult time will come. And um, so let, let me just hurry up a little bit here. The Apostle Paul points out the signs of the last day uh, changing people. Um, so realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Why? How? The men will become lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, reviler, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, uh, and uh, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of, the, of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Are we any closer to this? We have. We are saying things as a, as a country, as policies, a blasphemous things before God. We are not that far. 
You know, the terminology like reassigning gender, do you know how blasphemous that is? God is the one who's assigning. You cannot reassign what God has done. No matter what part of discussion you fall into, that's a wrong description. And, and things like that become normal to us. And, and so under the name of being inclusive, being fair, equal, equity, and all other things, the people are going to have to listen and follow. Otherwise, everything else, you know. So why am I saying this? Because we become undiscerning. And whatever, you know, uh, the, the medias and whatever else they say is somehow legit. And, and that's the problem, and that's why people are easy to uh, be influenced and deceived. Now, so persecution from outside, I mean, you know all this. And, um, you know, uh, let me just go to the other side. And uh, persecution from within the churches and uh, uh, apostasy. So what is important now, the important thing right now is the unity of churches is more important than ever before, but not any cost. There's an ecumenical movement going on, so every, we ought to come together and all that, but without the foundation of the scripture and, and in its authority, everything else becomes as bad. And so therefore, the churches have to come together and we have to understand, as long as they believe in the Bible, they have to come together and, and believe that we have the same Lord and same promise, same destiny, as well as the same enemy. Therefore, the church has to come together, right? The unity of the church is very important. And after that, believers must be alert and sober. Do not be afraid to be different from the rest of the world, but to stand firmly on the truth of the word of God. That's why more than ever before, knowing the scripture, studying it, that's not enough. You have to make that the standard of your life, your value system. You have to stick through it. You cannot just talk about it as a concept, an idea, but it is your lifeline because hard time will come. But the scriptures talks about in Revelation, you need to overcome, overcome that. All right. So, um, let me pass a few. I, I know I was afraid of this. This, this, this is going to get long, and, and, and you know, I can talk about many. So I cut out all the details, but still, you know. Um, um, so, the final is this. What is the purpose of apocalyptic writing? Is to comfort one another. For those people, for the sake of gospel, they are paying the price and suffering for that. And those people who have lost their properties, who have lost their dignities and reputation, and those who are suffering because of faith, because of promise of God, and for a season, the enemy will have won the battle and, and, and all that. And to them, uh, this, Paul talks about this. You know, the Bible never talks about when, when you're going through suffering and all that. So, oh, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to happen. It doesn't say that. It says, look, it's going to get tougher. But this is your promise. Believe in that and overcome, endure that. All right? And so here, uh, and the Paul says this, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then who, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, shall we, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself seriously, do you believe in this reality? This future reality that, that blows our mind, our imagination of what reality is. And this is what we await for us. Therefore, how we ought to conduct ourselves. We talked about last week, 
If you deny me before man, you also will be denied. And therefore, even through tough times, overcome hardship with unwavering hope in Christ Jesus. Because unimaginable future awaits for us. Therefore, don't get mired in with the petty things, but fix your eyes upon big picture, an unchanging reality of God's sovereignty. Amen? I was looking for a picture, and I found this. <laughs> but you know what? I think it's a Mormon picture. Uh, so never mind that, because Mormons always make Jesus a white man with a blonde hair. So, Never mind that, but you know, can you imagine what waits for you? Can you imagine that day the Lord himself will descend with shouts, voice of an archangel, and the trumpets of God will sound? Man, that's what we believe in, right? Right? We talk about personal relationship forgiveness. We talk about inner healing. We talk about marriage counseling. We talk about time management. We talk about all the how to overcome addiction. These are small things. This is what God has prepared. And God wants us to be joined in that. That's why the Son of God, the Son of Man, came and paid a terrible price so that we may be with him. For eternity. That's for which you live. You're not living, looking for that retirement so they can buy an RV and drive up and down Florida coast, <laughs> avoiding hurricanes. <laughs> That's not your end. Why you act like that? Your kid's going to good school, let's say I believe, and they're corrupt in their mind and come out as something that you cannot recognize. Is that what you're, what you're prepping your kids for? Is, is that why you are so up in arms about soccer games and all that? Is that it? You're going to ruin your children? I'm not saying when you go to good school, you always, oh, you go to bad school. You can get messed up in bad school too. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. What are you living for? Why are you so obsessed with something? When this is what God is saying, this is your reality. And, and, and to make it worse, there is going to be falling away from within the church. Therefore, take your faith seriously. Stand firm on the ground. Know the scripture so that the Lord will welcome you as a good and faithful servant. Amen.